Hello and welcome to Donaldson Clean Solutions webinar, Maximizing Equipment Uptime in Remote Locations. I'm Jim Doyle, Senior Engineer with Donaldson Company. The objectives for the presentation today include how to protect your on-site fuel investment, some techniques for extending the life of your on-engine fuel filter and injectors, and some best practices for fuel quality management. In protecting your on-site fuel investment, uh, keep in mind that once fuel is loaded into your tank, you own it. Adding good fuel to bad or bad fuel to good only makes a bigger batch of bad fuel. If you have 7,500 gallons of diesel fuel that's not causing problems in your storage tank and you add 7,500 more gallons into it that has an issue that might start plugging fuel filters unexpectedly, you now have 15,000 gallons of fuel that's likely to cause you uh, unexpected downtime and you own it. That now needs to be dealt with in that storage tank or with a cleaning of that storage tank. It's not possible to take that fuel back out and get rid of the issue. Some examples of uh, remote and critical operations include backup power gen sets for all sorts of municipal and large in, uh, commercial buildings. Remote locations, uh, power gen sets for uh, off-grid uh, operations and, and seasonal use facilities, emergency response systems like fire pumps and things like that, uh, data centers, uh, backup data uh, power supplies are, are a big deal for any major uh, company doing a lot of uh, internet business, pretty much anybody with online presence. Uh, gas turbine and power gen, uh, it, the backup fuel supply for that is frequently uh, diesel fuel, they can convert from natural gas to diesel fuel when natural gas supplies run short, say in the winter when uh, it, the preference is for heating homes with natural gas rather than just power gen. Uh, hospitals always have to have a large backup power supply and that's routinely diesel fuel uh, with diesel electric power generation. Water treatment facilities and sewage transfer, that kind of thing, a lot of that has backup power for emergency operation when, when there is no uh, grid power source. Telecom also for communications in emergency situations to keep those, those uh, means of communication open is also uh, common. So protecting the on-site fuel investment, uh, isolation is the key to keeping it stable in storage. Uh, some Just a schematic to go over that shows the a fuel with its particulate and water load coming in and doing filtration on delivery where possession transfer uh, takes place routinely. Uh, doing high efficiency particulate filtration and maybe even water absorption at that point to ensure no free water is being put into the storage tank. Um, isolating it from the atmosphere that it's, it's being stored in by putting at least a particulate breather uh, and perhaps a, 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 a silica gel or trap breather on there uh, and then even further to uh, to uh, actively dry that headspace to keep any condensation from going on inside that storage tank and building up water and then on the outlet side if if needed or possible doing a, a final filtration there to ensure that anything that has generated or been picked up in the storage tank is filtered out before it goes on to any uh, critical operation on the outlet of the tank that may be the, the pump feeding directly to the engine or filling some equipment. Uh, so when protecting your on-site fuel investment, it's critical to remember that uh, you don't really know how clean is the fuel you're putting in your tank unless you're actually looking at it. This is a uh, 100x magnification of the debris in a, uh, in a fuel supply. It has a fair amount of wind-blown dust in it. Uh, this is from a very dusty environment. but. Uh, an operation in a dusty environment. There's a couple of large sand grains there that are big enough to probably see with the naked eye, but most of the rest of that is far smaller than you can see with the naked eye, and uh, there's a fair amount of it in there, and almost all of that, everything you can see there is four microns or larger, is critical to uh, uh, a modern high-pressure common rail engine and needs to be removed. So if you put clean fuel into the tank, you won't be building any of that type of debris up in the tank and the tank will stay clean. Uh, filtering fuel on delivery can, can turn what uh, you see there on the upper left into 
what you see on the lower right, that is literally a sample up and downstream of a filter on a fuel supply coming into a storage tank. So you can do the vast majority of the particulate removal work when you take possession of it. It keeps your tank clean and your fuel will be uh, much better in storage if it doesn't have all that particulate in it or with any of that settling to the bottom and, and building up in your storage tank. Uh, another thing to uh, keep in mind when uh, keeping your fuel both clean and dry is the fact that uh, modern fuel with biodiesel blended in it does tend to have an interaction with water and keeping that fuel as dry as possible will limit another form of solids generation that can lead to plug-in filters. This is a highly filtered sample of diesel fuel you see on the left here. You can see all the way through the bottom of the bottle uh, and out the other side. It's very clean. All particulate, hard particulate has been removed from it. Uh, and then it was uh, allowed to add uh, moisture. This is wet fuel, but not wet to the point where there's free water. This is near saturation fuel. You can see it has gotten cloudy. And then it was allowed to sit. This is all at room temperature, this example here. This fuel is just allowed to sit for a few days. And when you tip the bottle over, you can see there are solids in the bottom of this bottle. And that is uh, a component in the biodiesel blend that is uh, basically competing for solubility space in the fuel. Uh, and it's called glycerin. It's a, it's a uh, byproduct of the manufacture of biodiesel. And most of it is removed in the manufacturing process. However, once that biodiesel is blended with ultra low sulfur diesel it tends to compete for space in the fuel with water so if the fuel is kept very dry the glycerin stays in solution at the at temperature and if it gets wet it can start to drop out and form solids like this as fuel cools it also wants to hold on to less glycerin and it can tend to drop out but the drier you keep it uh, in storage when uh, it, it, the less likely it is to create any of these solids and cause plugging issues in the, in, uh, when you go to run on this diesel fuel. This is another image of tank bottoms from a, a biodiesel blend uh, system. This is magnified a bit to look and see what that stuff in the bottom of that bottle actually looks like. This is actual real tank bottoms. Uh, but those are big globs of mainly glycerin and water. They form sort of an amorphous gel or goo and they tend to entrain some small particulate with them as well, and it builds up in the bottom of tanks. And it's unless a pump picks it up, it's not going to get transferred to a filter, but as it builds up, eventually uh, the flow rate out of the tank may start to pull some of that along with it and, and out of the system and, and start plugging filters on the outlet side of the tank, whether that's going to a, a diesel generator or a dispenser pump or uh, wherever it may be going. Um, the idea is to prevent those from, from forming in the first place if possible. Uh, if they do start to form, you can have some unhappy conditions here. Uh, this filter patch uh, speaks volumes. Uh, it's covered with globs of glycerin that uh, are going to be plugging filters. And it has a bit of particulate in it as well. And uh, it's an unhappy situation. Solids forming in storage. Uh, like this can lead is a very common cause of unexpected filter plugging and you need to get to tank clean out and and start over to to get away from it uh, some best practices like I said to to uh, to limit that is to clean the tank out completely you need to get as much of that stuff out of there as you possibly can to start with a fresh clean slate if you're going to change your your approach to keeping your fuel in storage and, and, and protecting it the best you can, it's much better to start out with a clean tank than it is to start protecting a tank that hasn't been maintained properly for a long time and hope the problem goes away. That material will tend to stay in the bottom of the tank. And filter the fuel on delivery as shown earlier. You can do the vast majority of the particulate removal of the fuel before it goes into your tank. There isn't anything to accumulate in the bottom of your tank. Uh, and then protecting it with a breather and isolating it from moisture if you can by perhaps purging the tank will limit any other solids formation and storage and keep things uh, in the best condition possible. And fuel kept clean and dry in storage uh, is much better over the long term, say 9 to 12 months. Um, there is no expiration date specific to any fuel supply, but it can it can vary 
Um, the 100% biodiesel uh, manufactured typically has some stability improver in it, um, and that has, but that has a relatively short uh, shelf life. Uh, straight ultra low sulfur diesel fuel has a, a fair bit longer storage um, shelf life, but it, the blend of the two together is somewhere in between, and the better the storage conditions, the, the more stable it will stay. There are also some other things that can uh, improve that, that uh, length of storage, and we'll cover those too. So here's an example of a tank that's a, a typical tank you see around uh, storing fuel. This is a 10,000 gallon fuel tank with fuel being loaded into it. You can see the hose at the lower left there that goes into the storage tank, fuel being pumped into the storage tank, and there's a breather visible there, an open pipe just with a screen on it sticking up high in the air there that's just the top of the photo. There's no protection on this tank other than uh, just the tank itself. The, there's a piece of screen in there to keep birds and bugs out, but other than that, fuel is basically just sitting exposed in that tank. And here's that tank uh, fitted with some protection. Fuel is being pumped into it again, but it's going through a manifold of filtration there that is doing virtually all the particulate removal. That's essentially the same efficiency of filtration as a secondary filter on a piece of equipment. So we know fuel going into this tank has no solids in it, and there's now a breather keeping uh, partic airborne particulate from getting into the tank. That's a three micron uh, uh, air breather, and it has uh, the ability to, to absorb some water to try and do a little protection from water on this system as well. And on the outlet side, fuel coming out of this wasn't going directly into an engine. It's going into a, a, a fleet. And there's filtration protection on the outlet side to make sure anything that happened in storage won't transfer onto vehicles so they maximize uptime and operability. For remote emergency uh, power applications, a backup for either buildings or uh, facility, remote facilities or whatever, this is a very typical system you would see. Inside this containment uh, box is a diesel engine coupled to an electric generator. And the base of this system that looks like an I-beam around the bottom there is actually the fuel storage system for this. Uh, it's, it's the support that the rest of the structure and the engine and stuff sit on. And that has almost no protection. You can see a uh, small green pipe with a turned over end on it there on top. That is the air breathing system for this tank. It has no protection and fuel is just poured into an open cap inside the cabinet. So it's basically sitting unprotected. Here's another very, uh, a little bit larger, but another typical uh, backup diesel generator system. There's a little bit larger engine and an electrical uh, an electric generator in this system coupled together and they're sitting on a, about an 1800 gallon fuel tank on the bottom there. You can see um, that system, that system uh, historically it had an issue with fuel storage uh, not seeing two years of, of, of uh, fuel life the fuel in the tank would uh, would go off on oxidative stability numbers uh, sometime beyond one year but well short of two years and it was a cost to dispose of that fuel and buy new fuel as the backup for this generator it wasn't continually running and burning that fuel uh, this system was uh, uh, approached uh, similar to what we've been outlining here. The tank was cleaned out and then retrofitted with a few things to uh, allow for better fuel storage conditions. Instead of just an open pipe and dumping fuel in, a uh, connection was made to pump fuel into the system uh, where the fuel nozzle, the open pipe used to be, is now a cam lock connection. Uh, and inside the, the system inside the cabinet. Uh, filtration was fitted in there to do particulate removal followed by water removal as fuel is going into the tank. We know that we're not adding particulate and there is no free water going into the system. And it was also set up so that a, a uh, recirculation pump can be hooked up and utilize these uh, filters if needed to circulate the fuel in that tank. Uh, getting that tank cleaned out can be a challenge. That's a large flat tank with a lot of other supports in it for holding up the engine and getting that tank circulating around and getting all the debris out of there was critical to improving the storage conditions and then retrofitting this ability to, to continue to do that if needed in the future uh, has improved storage conditions dramatically. 
This tank was also fitted with a breather to stop ingress of water and, and particulate. And fuel has now been sitting in that tank, the same tank, for four years and has not gone off on oxidative stability. It is a long-term storage fuel, but again, it was the same fuel that was having a, a, a less than two-year life previously and has now gone successfully to a four-year storage uh, based on, at least partially, on these improvements. And here's another example of cleaning a tank. This is a bit smaller tank. It's a 500-gallon horizontal. There's lots of these around uh, for, for small uh, uh, remote power gen and things like that. They're used for lots of things. But you can kidney loop a tank like that if you draw the fuel down as low as you can and, and uh, get the bottom of that tank reasonably clean with a fairly small flow rate. This tank was not terribly contaminated, circulated at about 15 gallons a minute with this little this little uh, filter uh, skid for particulate and water removal. The fuel cleaned up quite nicely and in much better shape. Um, things get lots bigger on, on larger storage tanks. There's tank cleanout services that can come out. Typically you want to draw the tank down as far as you can and then vacuum out the bottom and it may require an opening a manway and getting in the tank and doing a man down cleaning. But getting things clean is critical to getting starting over and getting a new uh, a, a new regime for storage quality of fuel over over the long term. Other considerations for long-term stability are uh, fuel stability improvers. Many fuel uh, retailers will will supply a fuel that has uh, a fuel stability improver in it uh, at a higher level than normal for fuels that are going to be used as backup power uh, uh, sources so that you have some more uh, antioxidants in there to prevent the fuel from breaking down in storage. Uh, the fuel will likely cost a bit more, but it's actually tailored for doing this type of uh, service while sitting for uh, months and months or even a few years. Um, biocides and monitoring uh, for water buildup and, and microbial growth can also be very critical. Uh, this is an example of a fuel sample and tank bottoms from a tank that has fuel that looks fairly wet on top and there's actually water on the bottom. Uh, the function of biocide and fuels is not to stay in the fuel itself but actually to migrate to that interface. Uh, microbes and fuel can't live in the fuel itself. They need to be exposed to both fuel and water so they tend to grow at the interface of fuel and water and that's right there at the bottom of the tank if there's free water allowed to build up. Uh, they'll do their job and kill the bugs but the most robust approach is to limit the amount of water there is in the bottom of the tank. If there is no water, the bugs cannot grow. If there's no water, there's no life. Dead bugs or inactive bugs can float around in the fuel, but they cannot grow and multiply and start consuming the fuel and causing problems. So there's a two-pronged approach to using biocides, and that's dosing in the biocide, but first get all the water out, then dose in the biocide, Maintain water as best you, low water as best you can, and continue to dose with biocide. So that can help fuel stability long term as well. And another critical thing to consider is buying fuel fit for use when you need it. If it's in the summer months and you're buying fuel for a backup generator that's likely to see service in the winter in the northern half of North America, uh, you need to make sure you have fuel fit for use when you need it. And here's an example of some fuel samples. On the left in this image is a, is a number one diesel in winter uh, at 10 below zero. It's liquid. Uh, you can see through it, it's clear. And the other two samples are number two diesel fuel at the same temperature, obviously. And they are f full of, of uh, gel or wax, whatever you want to call it, solids. And they will, that will tend to plug filters quickly that are on protecting a modern high-pressure common rail diesel engine. Uh, those wax particles are easily large enough to start loading in the primary and secondary on an engine and can, can uh, cause issues with operability and start up uh, when needed. So the most robust approach for picking a fuel for uh, emergency conditions and, and long-term storage is to make sure you buy a fuel that it will be liquid when you need it most. And having a natural cloud point at or below your expected low temperature is the most robust approach to that. Uh, back to the gas turbine uh, diesel fuel storage situation uh, we covered a little bit earlier and mentioned. 
This is a 900,000 gallon storage tank that sits about half full of diesel fuel. So there's 450,000 gallons of fuel and 450,000 gallons of headspace in this system. And that 450,000 gallons of headspace cannot have a breather on it. This is a very large tank. It has an eight inch diameter pipe that turns over to keep the rain from going directly in, but there is no other blockage there. A bird could literally fly in and out of the system. Um, but this system was also developing about 20,000 gallons a year of, of water at the bottom of the tank. The, uh, and that was causing fuel stability issues and plugging issues on filtration as it feeds the gas turbine. So this tank was drained and fitted with a dead bottom drain, a low point drain. The tank bottom was sloped to one point and there's a valve there to drain water off the very, very bottom of the tank. And the system was obviously taken, cleaned out, put back into service and filled with 450,000 gallons of fuel. Air was purged over the surface of this tank, the surface of this tank and out the breather, dry air to prevent condensation from happening in that 450,000 gallons of headspace. And in two and a half years since this was done, there has been no water drain from the bottom of that tank. So the source of the moisture is clearly the condensation uh, in, that, in the headspace of that tank, and that's now gone. The fuel is actually consumed and replaced again with another 450,000 gallons of fuel, and there still has been no water dropout in the system. And speaking of that replacement of that fuel, the 450,000 gallons that went into the tank went through filtration on the way in to protect the investment in that tank. And so particulate removal is done on delivery. That system can actually recirculate through that manifold as well with just some piping. And the purging system has stopped any of the, any dust ingress and, and, any, and any water uh, condensation problems going on inside that tank. So fuel is in much better condition in storage in that system than it was with, uh, with the prior additions. One final thing to touch on briefly is, the, uh, is, is something that uh, called the Donaldson Wavelength here. This is a system for monitoring pressure drop and temperature uh, of a filter in service on a remote or, or uh, disconnected application. This is a battery powered system that is certified class one div two hazardous location uh, for, for use in those locations, typical of tank farms, diesel fuel tank farms and things like that. And it's battery powered, sending a cell signal uh, to send a text or an email notification of uh, pressure drop conditions across that filter are reaching the point where it may be time to start plugging filters. This can give remote indication of a, of a critical piece of infrastructure that, that has a filter starting to plug and it may be time to service it before that, that uh, system needs to get up and operating uh, in, in legitimate service. So it's an advanced notification technology uh, coming into the market today. It can be implemented on single filter heads, on, on manifolds of various types, and just give uh, in critical applications that, that advanced notice that's so, so important to keep things running. Uh, that's it for this webinar, and uh, please join us at mycleandiesel.com if you haven't already. Uh, it's a great source for uh, all things diesel. This webinar will be posted there, uh, is posted there, and there will be there's several others on many of the topics we sort of brushed over here on biodiesel and moisture, uh, water contamination, fuel properties, uh, best practices for mobile situations, all sorts of topics. There's lots of standards, links, um, links to all all sorts of factors of, associated with diesel fuel. So. Again, connect with us today and thank you for your time.